All right, welcome to the latest Real Health webinar. This is webinar number one of the 10 steps to renew your energy. And step number one is to eat a real food diet. So if you're not familiar, if you just clicked on this webinar and you don't know, this webinar is part of a series, a series of a total of 12 webinars. We've, we've done one already on the 10 steps to renew your energy. And just going through each of those 10 steps pretty briefly, but then we're doing individual webinars for each of the 10 steps, and there's even a bonus webinar at the end. But this is step number one, is to eat a real food diet. And this is so incredibly important, and these are 10 steps to renew your energy. But if these were 10 steps to lose weight, if these were 10 steps to reverse diabetes, if these were 10 steps to get off medication, if these were 10 steps to sleep better, 10 steps to anything towards your health, step number one would be eat a real food diet. So when it comes to your energy, it's no different. You have to start with step number one with eating a real food diet. And we mentioned, you know, in our intro webinar, you know, there's a lot of different chronic conditions today that are really affecting our energy. There's hypothyroidism, there's fibromyalgia, there's chronic fatigue syndrome, there's tired all the time syndrome. That's, that's a real thing. But what I am talking to more, and if you have, you know, one of those diagnosed conditions, you, you absolutely need to do step number one. You need to do steps one through 10 probably, and you absolutely need to work with a coach or a practitioner to really get to the bottom. By the time you have something diagnosed, it's going to take more work. It's probably been developing for a longer period of time. But the people that I am really excited to talk to about their energy are the people that don't know that they've lost it. How many times we have you know, patients come into our clinic that you know, fatigue is not one of their primary complaints? But then when we reevaluate, we re-examine a month later and ask them how they're doing, they say, oh my gosh, my energy is through the roof. My sleep is better. I'm just, you know, have all this energy that I didn't know was there. And that's most people. Everybody out there has lost some of their energy. But we look around us and we see, oh, that's how my brother is. That's how my sister is. That's how my wife or my husband is. That's how my friends are. We, we just like sitting on the couch. Um, and we think that that is, is normal. Because it's very common, we think that it's normal, but it's not. You should have abounding energy. And, and I said Americans have an energy crisis. And I don't mean gas, I don't mean oil, I don't mean solar power, I don't mean renewable energy, I mean our, our energy. Getting off the couch and living our life full of love and life and vitality and just doing the things that we love with the people that we love. And when you realize that energy is not where it should be, you think, well, where do I, where do I begin? Well, you begin with step number one, and that is to eat a real food diet. Okay, so this is not some special energy boosting diet. It is really just uh, eating real food food and I'm going to go through that why that's so critically important why the standard American diet zaps your energy and sucks your energy dry so why do we want to eat real food well quite simply because the majority of our diet today is not 90% of the calories that Americans are taking in are from processed foods and I'm going to go through you know why is that a problem you might think well processed foods you know what an amazing invention, what an amazing creation, not true. 90% of our calories come from processed foods, and that is not real food. Now, 60%, 60% of our calories are ultra-processed. That's gas station food. That, that is you know, just complete junk. And when you're putting junk into a Ferrari, which your body is, your body is an amazing, amazing machine that's designed to produce just a, a, an incredible amount of energy to be able to get things done. Uh, you're putting junk into that, it bogs it down, it clogs up the pathways, and it creates what's called inflammation. Okay, and so you see that processed foods create inflammation. And you may have heard of that term before, uh, inflammation. You know, and the best example is, 
you know, say I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's going to swell up, or I sprain my ankle, it's going to swell up. That's inflammation. Now, that's a good thing. Inflammation is a healing response. Inflammation is an immune response. We want that when we have an acute injury. But inflammation of our cells, inflammation of our brains, inflammation of our what's called hypothalamus and our pituitary glands affects our hormones, affects our brain fog, our neurotransmitters, and really can create uh, all the problems that we see today that zap our energy. So going back to that slideshow, inflammation leads to hormone disruption. Hormone disruption leads to weight gain, and weight gain leads to lower energy. So this is really a, a kind of a, a vicious cycle of fake food and low energy because you lose your energy, and then when the time comes, for you to go to the gym or for you to go even walk the dog or for you to go play with your kids, you think, well, uh, I, I just, I don't feel like it. I, I don't want to, I don't have the energy. And so let's use, you know, going to the gym as, as an example. Then you skip the gym. You don't get the energy benefits from exercise. You don't get the weight loss, the metabolism benefits from the exercise. So then the next day, the next week, the next month, your energy goes even further down. So all of this is a vicious, vicious cycle. Now when we talk about hormone disruption and leading to weight gain, I'm gonna talk in a second about what those hormones are, but weight gain is just the simplest example. You can be you know, as thin as I am, have these exact same problems. Uh, it's not about your weight, but if you do think about, you know, if you are, are like most Americans and you're carrying around an extra 20, 30, 40 plus pounds, think about if you lost that. And, you know, I use the example of a 20 pound weight vest that I wear from time to time. And, and, and the thing about that is try walking up a flight of stairs. Do you think your energy is high or do you think it's low? You're dragging. But when you take that off, when you lose 20 to 30 to 40 pounds, your energy goes through the roof. And it's not just about the weight loss, though. It's really about the hormone disruption and the inflammation. So inflammation, hormone disruption. So inflammation leads to hormone disruption and food additives, fake foods, processed foods create this. So you have to really be tying the, or putting the pieces together, connecting the dots of this puzzle here and putting this together. Fake foods create inflammation. Inflammation creates hormone disruption. So what are the hormones that we're talking about here? You know, a lot of times people hear hormones and they think about, you know, that time of the month for a woman or they think about, you know, reproductive hormones. But the hormones that we're talking about here, it's insulin. Insulin is your fat producing hormone. Fake foods, we know that fake sugary junk foods spike insulin. That's why we have such an epidemic of diabetes today. Uh, leptin, leptin is your, uh, insulin is your fat storage hormone. Okay, so if you're eating high sugar, you're pre-diabetic, you're diabetic, you are storing fat uh, at a higher rate because of high insulin. It's also an aging hormone. It's also what creates wrinkles in your skin and degeneration of your spines or your joints or your knee or your hip insulin. Now, leptin is your fat burning hormone. It tells your body to burn fat. We also have uh, hormones like the thyroid, which controls metabolism, and hormones like your adrenal hormones. In all of these problems, inflammation in all of these areas zaps your energy, absolutely destroys your energy. So when your hormones are communicating, say they're telling your body to burn fat, like leptin, for example, what happens with inflammation is inflammation happens at a cellular level level and all of your hormones are trying to speak to your cells and trying to tell them different things they're like a key that unlocks a lock what inflammation is like cellular inflammation is like somebody putting hot glue gun into your keyhole and not being able to get that key in and unlock the things that need to happen so like insulin for example would become insulin resistant it's like wearing down the key. Maybe you just use it so often and so often that the key no longer works. Somebody came and they put hot glue in your lock, 
the key doesn't fit in anymore. Leptin is the same thing. Your body just hears leptin, 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 and eventually the inflammation, the spike in these hormones for too long, your body can no longer hear it. You can no longer get your key in that lock to unlock these metabolic processes. Thyroid is another one. Every single cell in your body has receptors for thyroid hormone, but it doesn't do any good to give your body more thyroid hormones if they're not getting into your cells. That's kind of like pouring gas on your car. You're pretty close, you're pretty close, but gas on your car doesn't help at all. The gas has got to get in the car. Closely related to that one are your adrenal hormones, very, very closely related to your energy systems. So when you are living a go, go, go lifestyle, you're eating an inflammatory standard American diet. Your adrenal hormones, which control your body's stress levels and help boost your body's energy, they get zapped, and that zaps your energy. So real food, and I shouldn't say more like fake food, is really at the root of this problem. Now, with the other 10 steps we're going to go through with the other 10 webinars, all of these are an issue but they go in exact order. For example, you know, talking about the adrenals or the thyroid, well, I see absolutely no purpose in doing an adrenal or a thyroid lab test or doing a protocol or a workup for adrenal or, or thyroid dysfunction if you're not eating a real food diet first. Sometimes those things are warranted, and I think that oftentimes they're warranted, especially in today's you know, modern-day autoimmune, low-energy epidemic. Uh, definitely warranted, but you can't walk before you crawl, right? And you can't run before you, before you walk. You have to go in certain order. So step number one is eating the real food diet. And there are a million, and that's not even an exaggeration, a million different resources out there. You can type into the internet how to eat real food. You can look up paleo things. You know, there's a lot of different diets and a lot of different variations, a lot of different things that we even do here in the office, like intermittent fasting, like a ketogenic diet, one of my favorites. But really the basis is to start by just eating real food because what that does is it eliminates the fake food. It eliminates the junk that's causing hormone disruption and inflammation. Now, once you've done that, once you've taken step one, you're starting to eat real food. Sure, there are tweaks. There are things that you can improve on. There are even real foods that grow naturally that we still want to avoid, like higher sugar foods or grains for inflammation. But a great place to start is eat a real food diet. Eat foods by God, not foods by man. Eat foods that grew on a plant, not foods that were processed in a plant really really important so food additives you know what's being added to our food and that's what we really have to look at when you look at uh, you know chronic disease and inflammation you know so often people just get the impression that they're eating real food because the box that they're eating says potatoes and there's a picture on the outside of potatoes or the cereal that they're eating says blueberries, blueberry pomegranate cereal. But you flip over the ingredients, there's no blueberries, there's no pomegranates. So the first thing you have to do before we even get into these food additives, you have to realize that just because it looks like real food on the box, if it comes in a box, it's not real food. If it comes in a can, it might be. If it comes in a bag, sometimes. But for the most part, this is why they say you want to shop around the outside of the grocery store because that's where all the real foods are. They have to be refrigerated, the, the, the good quality meats, the produce. You know, you can get really everything in your standard grocery store, not Costco. Your standard grocery store walking around the outside, you can really get everything that you need. So these, these food additives that we're going to go through are the things that you need to, to become an expert on flipping over your food label, looking at the ingredients. Now looking at the nutrition facts. It, you know, it can be important to know how many carbs or fats or proteins or fiber are, are in your food. But for this concept of eating real food, 
flip it over and look at the ingredients. If the ingredients are carrots and sea salt and water, that's real food. If the ingredients list is 15 items long and you need a degree in chemistry to understand what the different ingredients mean, it's not a real food. If you're holding a box, just because it has a picture of potatoes on the outside and it says potatoes, that's not a potato. We all know what a potato looks like. Just because you're holding something that says, oh, these are, these are carrots or these are kale chips or these are, you know, quote unquote health food, that's not a real food. When you flip over the ingredients and you see 25 different items that went into the making of this, it's absolutely not a real food. So all these food additives that we're about to go through, they're chemicals. Your body does not know what to do with them. I'm not going to go through each one and say scientifically what it does. I'm going to go through some, though, for sure. But they all lead to the same problem. In fact, we have a, a great podcast and a great blog article on seven food additives that cause a leaky gut and lead to autoimmune disease. And, and this is not my opinion. This is not even my list. I took it from an article, a review article published in the Journal of Autoimmune, Autoimmunity Reviews. And they just go through these seven food additives that are published in the literature and known to cause a leaky gut, which, which you know we're going to get to in one of the further steps down the road. But a leaky gut basically allows bad things to get into your bloodstream and lead to autoimmune disease. So they poke holes in your gut and they lead to autoimmune disease. And this is not controversial in the least bit, very, very well published in the scientific literature, all these things. So food additives, number one to look for, sugar. Okay, a lot of people have heard this today, but you need to look for sugar on your ingredients label. Now when you flip over a, a, an ingredients label, one thing that's important to note is that they are in order. So if you see high fructose corn syrup as the first ingredient, that means that it has the most in it. Now this might be a time to go to the nutrition facts. See how many grams of carbs, how many grams of sugar are there? That way you can kind of quantify it. But any added sugar, you want to absolutely eliminate. I'm not talking about reduce you want to eliminate any added sugars. Now, you even want to reduce and eliminate any natural sugars. Couple things that sugar does that we know. It increases inflammation, we know that. It's, it's well known science when your body burns sugar, it creates more oxidation or oxidative stress than when it is a fat burner. Sugar fuels cancer cells. Sugar fuels diabetes and spikes insulin, which is you know a big problem in our in our you know elderly population, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I'll tell you what's scary now is that our kids are now beginning to be pre-diabetic and already showing signs of insulin resistance, meaning that somebody started to squirt a little bit of glue into that keyhole. The key's not working as smoothly as it was the first day they got it, and something is starting to happen where their cells aren't listening to insulin as well. It is the fast track to diabetes, which takes an average of eight years off your life. It's the fastest growing disease in our population and worldwide, and it's fastest growing in kids. Remember, it used to be called adult onset diabetes. Now it's called type two diabetes because it no longer onsets as adults. It's starting in our kids. So if we stop the webinar right now and you just learned to avoid sugar, uh, you're, you're starting off on the right foot, but there are a ton of food additives that you want to avoid. Number two is salt. And, and this one is a tricky one because this is added salt. And, and, and you know, high sodium foods, you know, if you have a heart condition or something, you've probably heard this before, to avoid salt or we want to reduce salt. Well, I completely disagree with that when you're adding it to real food. If I'm making a salad that is kale and spinach and salmon and some good fats and, and you know maybe it has some some quinoa, you know I don't do a lot of grains. That's kind of a pseudo grain. Remember the grass family. But you know, say you're making a salad that I want to add salt. I want to add sea salt. But processed foods, what they found is that all of our processed foods have a hundred times, one hundred times, up to at least a hundred times the amount of salt that you would put in it if you did it at your table. 
Okay, and that is iodized, that is processed table salt. And table salt is sodium chloride. Two, two ingredients, sodium and chloride. Sea salt has over 80 different minerals. And the minerals are really important that they're balanced. You need a good balance. And so if you're just taking in sodium and chloride, your balance gets thrown off. So things like magnesium, you're not getting enough of. And then when you take sea salt, you're balancing that you know, quite, quite a bit better. So sea salt is something I strongly, strongly encourage. So this isn't referring to stop using sea salt. It's referring to don't eat processed food because it's loaded with sodium. It's loaded with salt. Rancid fats is the next one. Oh man, this one's horrible. It fuels inflammation, fuels heart disease, fuels you know, uh, high blood pressure and atherosclerosis in your veins, rancid fats. Now, these are most prevalent in our processed foods, the rancid fats. So that could be trans fats. So you might, you know, recognize that from your label saying zero grams trans fats. But the way that's going to look on the back, because sometimes the front might say zero grams trans fat, but the way it's going to look on the back is hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. So that's what you want to look for when you're looking at the ingredients label is there hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils on there. Avoid it at all costs. Now what you're going to start to see is these processed foods where we see this the most are in our cookies, our crackers, our boxed and packaged foods like those. So you might not think, well, this is a high fat food, but they use these horrible oils to, to process these foods and they create and fuel inflammation and disease. They spike your omega-6s and mess up your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, massively important for inflammation. Um, so you want to avoid these things like the plague. Some of the other bad fats that you want to avoid that are really, really common, canola oil can be found in almost anything that you flip over that's boxed or packaged or bagged like a bag of chips. Uh, soybean oil, both of those heavily genetically modified. We're going to talk about that in a second, what that means. Uh, Cottonseed oil, corn oil, any corn oil. You want to avoid these grain-based oils. They're massively high in inflammatory omega-6s. They're not very stable. They turn rancid very, very quickly, and they fuel and create inflammation. So I'm not talking about cooking with it. Now, you don't want to cook with vegetable oil, with canola oil, with Crisco. You know, these things fuel inflammation and literally the fast track to disease. But I'm talking about where they sneak them in and everything processed is going to contain some form of bad oil because they're cheap. The next one are, are, are chemicals, you know, and I don't have time to really get into the names of these. Uh, go back to the podcast on, on the seven food additives that cause a leaky gut. But these are things like surfactants, emulsifiers, solvents, colorings, sweeteners. It's shocking when you start digging into this. They call it food forensics. You know, what is really being put in our food? And it's crazy what they've done to the food to change it to make you want it more. And it works, right? I mean, we all have food addictions. We have food cravings. There are literally addictive components like this artificial sweeteners, uh, which you know diabetics take, but they increase insulin resistance. They're, they're putting glue in your keyhole uh, and you can't stick your key in even though they're not spiking your blood sugar because they're artificial sweeteners. There's things like MSG, which is a known neurotoxin, like the sweeteners, like aspartame, like sucralose, known neurotoxins. So is MSG, a known neurotoxin that's known to be addictive that they put in the food to keep us coming back. Some of these other things, though, they do it to make them look better. They fluff up a cake. They change the texture of your meat, there are meat glues, there are meat texturizers that are added into all these foods. So you might go to you know, the grocery store, be walking around the outside, you find a steak, you think, oh, this one's grass fed, it's eight bucks. This one's conventional, it's five bucks. I'm gonna get the $5 one, 
But what they've done is they've texturized that meat. They've glued pieces of meat together. They've added things to make it look pinker and redder. And what you're eating is not meat. If you got it from a local farmer or if you get grass fed or you get organic, your chances of actually getting real food go up dramatically. And so these are some ways that they sneak this in. The other things that they do is, is like the surfactants and emulsifiers and solvents are designed to change the texture of the food. Like, you know, a cupcake or a cookie or a cracker, for example, that texture is not natural. They've added things in to make that look and taste a certain way because they know that that's what we like. They know that it tastes better. They know that we like the texture better. Um, they add those things in. So you have to really learn about those. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of like soy lecithin is a common one that you could find on your ingredients label. Lots of ingredients. Soy is very heavily genetically modified. Lecithins, you don't want to mess with, with lecithins. Not a good additive. Another one would be maybe like polysorbate 80. Uh, that could be seen on your food label. There's other things to preserve freshness, you know, preservatives that they put in. And all of these chemicals, although they might argue that they're, oh, they're in such small amounts, but they're all adding drops to your bucket uh, and creating inflammation and, and really leading to disease. Now, now, one thing I want to just mention about that, because it is drops in your bucket. You, now, you can handle, you know, a processed cookie or cracker or something, and you're not going to die tomorrow. That's the problem with all of this, is you're not going to die tomorrow. Just like you won't die tomorrow if you have a cigarette today over lunch. But you keep doing it over and over and over, and yeah, you're going to die. Your, your risk of dying goes up dramatically. Each week, each, each year, each month, each year that you're doing it, it goes up dramatically. So the analogy is, you know, what would the cancer risk be if our kids started smoking when they're two? It, it would go up dramatically, right? So why are we feeding our kids this crap junk food at two years old, at one year old? You know, first off, you know, they come out, mom eats junk. They come out, you know, C-section, never get good probiotics in their gut, eat a, an infant four months either. It's going to be dairy-based, which the risk of allergies goes up dramatically with any dairy, especially within the first year of life. Or it's going to be high fructose corn syrup-based, um, and, and it's going to be genetically modified. And, and all this crap, we're starting the inflammatory process so much sooner when we start feeding this stuff to our kids. And I had somebody ask recently, she said, well, I can feed my, my grandkids all this sugar. It's unbelievable how much sugar they can eat, and they don't gain weight. You know, we're talking particularly about weight gain. Yeah, they don't gain weight, but what does their future look like? Well, instead of gaining weight at age 50, like their grandfather did, or gaining weight at age 35, like their dad did, they're going to gain weight at age 20 because we started that process so much sooner. And instead of getting diabetes, at 60 like their grandpa did, or at 45 like their dad did, they're gonna get diabetes at 25. And that is how this happens. You're adding to the bucket all these chemicals, adding to the inflammatory process, and the diseases don't develop overnight. You know, Very few diseases do develop overnight, but every single drop in the bucket matters. Genetically modified foods this is a big one. Um, you know, I, I, you should just avoid, you know, if you're eating real food, you, this is never going to be an issue, but now it's even a concern. You know, if you've got corn, you know, you could watch this webinar and say, well, I'm going to eat real food. Like, like Dr. Taylor said, I'm going to go get, you know, some corn on the cob. And the chances are good or very, very good if it doesn't say organic, that it's genetically modified. And the concern is what they do is they modify these genes. They take out genes and put new genes in so that they're Roundup resistant. So they can spray Roundup on them and, and they, don't, they don't die from it. Um, and that alone, changing the genes, very, very dangerous, excuse me. Type into Google, you know, GMO rat tumors and look at some Google images of some tumors that have grown from genetically modified foods. But even the non-GMO foods now have what's called glyphosate on them, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, and that's why they genetically modify them. It's usually so they can be Roundup ready. Now, there's a new apple 
coming out on the shelves that's a genetically modified apple that doesn't brown. Well, here's a concept. Apples are supposed to brown. That's the way that they were made. That's the way that God designed them. And, and when we change that, we think, oh my gosh, what a beautiful invention. I now have an apple that doesn't brown. But that to me is crazy talk because the apple is supposed, uh, supposed to brown. And when you eat that apple that browns, it's a real food. Your body knows what to do with it. When you eat the apple that doesn't brown, your body is like, what is this? This is not a natural food. This is not something that I know how to use. And so it creates disease. So genetically modified foods you want to avoid. The, the top ones, corn, soy, cotton, beets. Uh, those are some of the ones that, that you want to look out for um, and just be aware of. Um, there's a couple squashes, now apples. Uh, there's not that many genetically modified foods. Uh, really, but they, there are ingredients in everything, like corn and soy, and, and think about this too, if you know anything about agriculture, which I, I don't, but those two are subsidized by our government. So I grew up in Illinois, so what is every direction that you look, what do you see? You see corn or you see soy, and the farmers were alternate. They do corn one year, then they do soy the next, and, and corn and soy grow all over our country. They're subsidized by the government, they're really, really cheap because of the subsidization. They put them in everything. So if you're eating real food, not really a huge concern. You're eating processed packaged food. You're getting genetically modified foods. You're getting these preservatives. You're getting these chemicals. You're getting all these additives, the added salt, all the things if you're eating fake food. So the problem is that eating fake food, you're getting all this. The solution is eating real food, you're getting none of this. So GMOs, another thing to learn about and to avoid like the plague. Like my girls, my, my two and a half year old twins, I don't know, I mean, I would hope to say that they've never had a genetically modified food. And if they have, it's been very few and far between because uh, it's something that, that we look at. We don't want, it doesn't mean that they're never gonna have one in their life, but we're not trying to start filling, filling the bucket now at age two. Uh, the last one, pesticides and herbicides. That's like glyphosate, like Roundup. And so the best resource for this um, is something called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. I'm going to put that list up here in a second. But there's a company out there, an amazing action group called the Environmental Working Group. Just a quick plug for them. They do the Dirty Dozen. They do the Clean 15, which is great. They do foods scores. They do uh, personal care products. They have a skin deep database that's tested over 60,000 personal care products and rates them and ranks them based on the toxins that they find. And so what they've done is they've measured these foods. I think the total list is maybe 48, 48 foods long. And they measure how much pesticide load and herbicide, how many chemicals are sprayed on the outside of this. These are real foods. Right, so we're eating real foods that grew in a field or grew on a tree or, or grew underground but grew on a plant, but they still are sprayed with chemicals. And so they measure this and they look at it. So let's pull that list up. Now, before I pull it up, you can get the app on your phone. Uh, that's one of the quickest, easiest ways. I have the app on my phone. So if I'm at the grocery store, I think, well, man, strawberries, are they clean or are they dirty? I don't remember. I just pull up the app on my phone. I believe they have an app that you can scan a barcode um, and it kind of rates your food there too. I don't use that one personally, um, but there are a lot of good resources from the environmental working group. So the dirty dozen, number one is strawberries, number two are apples. Uh, this is the, the 2016, I think, is the first year that strawberries have passed apples. There was one and two, but apples have almost always been number one. So what this means, what this list means, uh, is that these are the dirtiest 12 foods. So if you are going to, you know, there's no doubt that buying organic uh, produce is, is a little bit more expensive. You know, you see an organic avocado next to a non-organic avocado that are not going to be the same price. Um, but you don't have to buy everything organic. You're not going to go wrong by buying everything organic. You're a lot safer. Um, but these dirty dozen, these are the 12 foods that you absolutely want to buy organic. You do not want to buy them conventionally at all. So let me pull those back up. It's cherry or strawberries, rather, apples, nectarines, 
peaches, celery, grapes, cherries, spinach, tomatoes, sweet bell peppers, cherry tomatoes, and cucumbers. Okay, so and if you think about how all those grow, they tend to grow and just how they look. They have a thin skin. So every single one of those on that list, you eat the whole the whole food. You know, like an apple, you eat the skin. It's not like an avocado or a, uh, let's say, like a, a honeydew or what's, um, yeah, like a, a melon. You don't leave the skin. The, the skin comes with you. You eat it. So that's why they're, they're so dirty. Um, and they also tend to grow like in bunches or on trees where they just walk up and down the rows and they spray, 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 spray pesticides, spray herbicides, spray Roundup on all of these. And, and I, I, one of the things that I find awesome is that of this dirty dozen, uh, I have one, two, this year we're going to have grapes, three, four, five, six, seven of them growing in my garden. Okay, so cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, sweet bell peppers, tomatoes, spinach, and then we have three apple trees, and we grow strawberries as well. And this year, we'll probably add some of those others. So that's the best way to avoid all of this is to grow it in your garden. Um, and, and now that's not an option for everybody, of course, but there's a big grow your own food movement because even if you are buying these organic, they're still coming from somewhere that's not your backyard that's not your local soil, you can't control the way that people are handling them, what they're putting on them, things like that. The safest way is to just you know, grow your own food. But these dirty dozen especially, if you're gonna pick 12 foods to grow in your garden, pick the dirty dozen. Now the clean 15, that's the opposite. Those are the foods that they've measured that are the lowest in pesticide load. So number one is avocado. Uh, now sweet corn is number two. Now we already talked about I would avoid sweet corn because it's probably genetically modified But there's another good example pineapples have a thick skin on them that you don't eat uh, Cabbage grows under the ground onions too, you know, so some of these there's a, a logical explanation cantaloupe That's what I was looking for the, uh, in the honeydew family there um, But yeah, these are the clean 15 so a great example. So I'll read them avocado sweet corn pineapples Cabbage, frozen sweet peas. Now, that doesn't mean that frozen are any better than, than fresh sweet peas. Onions, asparagus, mangoes, papayas, kiwi, eggplant, honeydew, grapefruit, cantaloupe, and cauliflower. Some of those aren't necessarily the, the best real foods to eat, high sugar, fruits, things like that. But when you're looking at organic versus non-organic, those are the ones that you don't necessarily need to buy organic. And I'll give you num my number one example, which was the number one food on there, avocados. Avocados, we eat a ton of avocados. My girls love avocados. My wife and I eat avocados on, on practically everything. Um, a really, really good healthy fat. But avocados are number one on the clean 15. So I never buy organic avocados. Because if you're at the grocery store, you see a, 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 an avocado for 88 cents or see the other one for $1.48. And the organic one, you know, that's going to add up, especially with the amount of avocados that we eat. So we take a look at this list and the things that we get normally on this list, like onions or, or cauliflower um, or cabbage. We don't buy those organic every time. Avocados, we, we hardly ever buy organic avocados because they're on the clean 15 list. So we feel relatively safe doing that. So that's a great, great resource. Make sure you download the app. Make sure you get the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 so that you can start to learn these foods, but great resource to look at you know, when you're at the grocery store. I wanna give you three, real, three rules for eating real food because the number one rule is just eat real food, right? It just look at it and did this grow on a plant? Was this made in a plant? Is it boxed? Now, if it's packaged, that's sometimes a different story. A, a rule for that, good, better, best, goes uh, fresh, frozen, canned. So canned would be good. Uh, frozen is better. Fresh is best. So if you're getting something that comes in a bag, but it's frozen berries, it's frozen peas, it's frozen green beans, yeah, it's not as good as the one that came from your garden. It's not as good as the one that came from just the produce section. 
but you're still eating a real food. But you have to flip your label over and make sure. When you're getting into the can stuff, absolutely you have to make sure. One of the concerns with cans is really the metal in the can and the BPA plastic that they line the can with. So can is definitely your last option, but fresh, frozen, or can as far as your real food. But three rules to eating real food. Number one is reduce or eliminate sugar. Okay, so looking at your food label, looking and learning about things that turn to sugar. You know, maybe you need to go back and watch our blood sugar webinar, learn things about the glycemic index, learn things about how grains are bad. But once you're eating real food and you've eliminated all your fake food, reducing and eliminating sugar is rule number one. If there was one thing that you could do in the standard American diet, it'd start to reduce and eliminate sugar. Now, one of the things as we move into rule number two that I'll mention is, you know, fat through the 70s and 80s, fat became the enemy, okay? And, and so what they did is they started taking fat out of foods. Well, that made it taste bad. So guess what they put in? They put in a lot of sugar. So if you know the stats behind our sugar consumption, the average American eats a, a five pound brick pack of sugar every 10 days. Um, it's about 150 pounds of, of sugar per, per year of added sugar. The stats on sugar are crazy. It's coming from everywhere. So even if you're still eating grains, even if you're still eating fruits, reduce and eliminate any added sugars, anything that turns to sugar quickly, really important. But because they added all that sugar, it was, it was because they took out the fat. And what we're realizing now is that not only is fat not the enemy, it's quite the opposite. It is our number one thing that we need. Our brains are made of largely fat and water. Our cell membranes are made of fat, which that cell membrane, that is the keyhole that your hormones are trying to stick their lock into. So if you have inflamed uh, high omega-6 or just really inflamed cell membranes, it's because of bad fats, it's because of damaged fats and rancid fats and not enough good fats. So that is rule number two, increase your good fats. Now, those can be good sources of omega-3s, like grass-fed beef, uh, like salmon, wild-caught salmon, like chia seeds or flax seeds. You can get you know, some good fats from things like olives and olive oil, the monounsaturated, where the omega-3s are the polyunsaturated. You can get good fats, coconut and coconut products, coconut milk, coconut oil, olive oil, avocado oil, avocados, great source of fat, great plant-based source of fats. So increase your number of good fats. Increase your avocados, your nuts and seeds, your grass-fed or free-range uh, eggs, your grass-fed beef, um, let's see, olives, olive oil, and I don't know, I think I've given enough sources of good fats that you can increase there. Grass-fed butter is another one. But you know, equally as important, eliminate the bad fats, boost the good fats, reduce the sugar. Those two steps right there are your fast track to really reversing chronic disease. And step number three is kind of obvious considering what we're talking about, but just get rid of the toxins and the additives. So if you're eating real food, this shouldn't be a problem. But let's say you're watching this and you, you know, let's say you're, you're just the average American, which, which, Nothing wrong with that. Most people are. Uh, it's where everybody begins. And you know nothing about food. You're like, wow, real food. That's, that's, I want to try that. I'm overweight. I've lost my energy. I have pre-diabetes. I have high blood pressure. I have X, Y, or Z symptom or disease or diagnosis. I want to start. Where do I start? Well, three rules. Reduce your sugar. Eliminate your sugar. Add in good fats. When you add in the, the good stuff, the bad stuff just doesn't have a place anymore. And reduce and eliminate the toxins and additives. Eat real food by eating these, by following these three rules. Uh, and, and you're going to be on the fast track to not only getting your energy back, but reversing, you know, really whatever health issue you're dealing with. This is where it begins is with those three rules. 
So this slide got a little jumbled. So here's five more rules of what do, what do I eat? So those three are a starting place. Those three are a starting place in the three kind of overlying concepts uh, of, of how you want to begin to live your life. is Reduced sugar, increased good fats, and reduced toxins and additives. Those are kind of the principles that you want to follow. These are actual action steps and rules that, that you can think about when you're making your food choices. So those three things are kind of the three goals, the three priorities, the three objectives. These next five are kind of the way to make that happen. So number one thing that you want to do to make this a reality, and this goes back to you know avoiding sugars, no grains. So get rid of your grains. That is your breads, all breads, your pastas, your rice, your corn, okay? All these grains, and, and that is one of the hardest steps for people, but it is, is arguably the most important. Reducing grains and sugar and, and increasing good fats, I'd call them, I call them sixes, I call them you know, equal, but grains is really hard step to take. You know, everybody can increase, you know, ha start cooking with coconut oil, or eat more butter, people like that one, um, or add avocados to each meal. That step is easy. Reducing grains is a tough one. So that's breads, all bread products, get rid of them. Pastas, huge one, big carb loader. And the problem with these grains is they're inflammatory to your digestive tract and inflammatory to your cells. So the same problem, they turn to sugar. They turn to, to carbohydrates right away into sugar. But you know, if you're eating a piece of bread, you're not getting necessarily the, the sugar load that you get from maybe a, a, a candy bar or something. But uh, I will tell you something that's pretty interesting, and you can watch this on our blood sugar webinar on the realhealthresource.com. But they've done tests and shown that uh, a, a piece of wheat bread spiked blood sugar more than a can of Pepsi. So these do turn to sugar and do have the, the sugar effect and the insulin effect, but the grains themselves are inflammatory and create inflammation, including autoimmune disease. Even if you don't have celiac disease, you know, that's a pretty rare part of the population that have diagnosed celiac, but 80 to 90% of us have some form of gluten intolerance. So it's breads, even wheat bread, uh, it's pastas, even wheat pasta, it's rice, even brown rice. It's especially the white things, white flour, white bread, white rice. Those are horrible, but even, even the brown ones, get rid of those as well. Get rid of your grains, uh, any corn products there as well. Uh, number two, no dairy. So no grains and no dairy. Uh, this is what's called a, a paleolithic diet. You know, and many people have heard of that, that a paleo diet means looking at the way that we were ancestrally designed to function at the highest level. What can, what can our bodies use for fuel and how were we designed? And no grains and no dairy are rules number one and two of a paleo diet. Now, to me, dairy can be beneficial, uh, raw or grass-fed dairy, but you have to know that you react okay. You have to know that you don't have a leaky gut or any issues like that. So it's a slippery slope with the dairy, uh, but I would say no grains, no dairy. You know, if you do something like a, a whole 30, a 30 day paleo meal plan, you're eliminating grains, you're eliminating dairy, you're eliminating nuts and, or excuse me, beans and legumes right away. You're cutting those out because of inflammation that they cause. So no dairy, rule number two. Rule number three is limit your fruits. So remember I said that you start with eating a real food diet. Start by just eating real food. Then you start to look at, you know, am I minimizing my sugar? Am I increasing my good fat? And am I avoiding toxins? Then you get into these five rules. Limiting your fruits. Fruits turn to sugar very quickly, very rapidly, and have a high sugar content. Fruit juices are an absolute no-no for your kids, for anybody. They're just pure sugar. There's really no dietary benefit. You know, you think, well, it's high in vitamin C. Well, they've been pasteurized. They've been processed. 
the vitamin C has been killed. They are not high in vitamin C. And, and like the naked drinks, we just did a shop with a doc uh, grocery store tour. That's my favorite thing to point out because most people would pick up that naked drink and say, oh, this is the healthiest thing in the store. But you flip it over and it's got 43 grams of carbs and sugar in one little eight ounce bottle of it. Uh, not healthy. So limiting your fruits, the exceptions are berries. So like strawberries, as an example, is a berry, anything that ends in berry. So if you want to eat strawberries, eat strawberries because they're lower on the glycemic index. Now I chose that as an example because if you remember back to the dirty dozen, you want to eat organic strawberries, but then they're okay. And if you like strawberry smoothies, make a strawberry smoothie. You know, you look at the ingredients list of a McDonald's strawberry milkshake, there's no strawberries, there's no milk. There's 75 other things that aren't strawberries and aren't milk. You like the strawberry milkshake, make your own. Make it with coconut milk, make it with almond milk, make it with strawberries, maybe put some spinach in, maybe some grass-fed vanilla whey protein. You can make an amazing smoothie, but limit your fruits. Berries and Granny Smith apples are the exceptions, but that's rule number three. You eliminate grains, you eliminate dairy, limit fruit intake. Rule number four is eat a variety of bright colors and strong flavors. Okay, this is a really important rule that I don't feel like anybody else talks about um, other than my, myself. You know, you look at what are the foods that are bright in colors? Well, they're high antioxidant foods, they're high in polyphenols, they're, they're blueberries, they're your greens, they're your oranges, which I know is to not eat those. But there's a reason why these foods are, are beneficial because the colors aren't, you know, just to make them pretty. The colors are different things that make them healthy. So every single day, you want to eat every color of the rainbow. Really great uh, thing for kids, too. We have a checklist in the office that's come from the Institute for Functional Medicine uh, that has a checklist of, of all the different colors, all the purple foods, all the orange foods, all the, the red foods all the green foods, and has a checklist. You don't want to just get too hung up on greens, even though that's probably the best. But when you start to look into the others with bright colors, the things that make them bright are the things that make them very, very healthy. Uh, beets is another example. You know, they use beets for, for dye and for ink because the colors are so strong, and those are just really, really good, beneficial things that you're getting from these fruits and vegetables. The other one are strong flavors. Things like garlic, things like onions, things like your spices and seasonings, really strong flavors that you can't handle too much of. But like curcumin, as an example, massive anti-inflammatory, turmeric or curcumin, anti-inflammatory in your brain, in your joints, in your cells. Things like garlic, uh, great detoxers, onions as well, great to help aid your body's natural detox. And we actually have a, a podcast that's the top 10 foods to help your body's natural detox systems because your liver, your kidneys, they're designed to detox for you. So what foods can you eat to support those? And when you look at the list, the one thing that they have in common are bright colors and strong flavors. So you don't want to avoid garlic or onions because you know your breath's gonna smell or something you want to go towards those things because the reason they have bright colors and strong flavors is because they have amazing abilities to support your body's natural healing processes so that's rule number four rule number five with your animal products really really important is to get high quality animal products Okay, so that means grass-fed, if we're talking beef or red meat, that's organic. If we're talking about chicken, uh, it's wild-caught. If we're talking about salmon, it's free-range if we're talking about eggs. Now, one of the things with that that we have to mention is, yes, absolutely, it's going to be more expensive, but it's 100% going to be worth it. You know, they did a study looking at people that eat very healthy compared to people that don't, and they found that they spend an average – of a dollar fifty a day more, and it's about five hundred dollars a year, and and that's a lot of money to some to to a lot of people. Um, but what happens is the cost that you spend down the road decreases dramatically because heart disease, 
because cancer, because diabetes, because autoimmune disease cost a ton of money to you personally, to your employer perhaps, to you know your family who has to pay for your funeral when you die 10 years early or when you lose your retirement account because of your medical bills in your last couple of years. You know, that's the number one cause of bankruptcy today. And in the majority of those people who go bankrupt because of their medical bills, the majority had insurance. So if you think your insurance is going to protect you, it's not. The best protection is to eat a real food diet. Now, there's no guarantees. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but it's a first step, is to eat a real food diet. Take the action steps that you can. As your animal products, if you remember the food pyramid, you are what you eat, and you are, and then they eat you know, what's below them, and then so on and so forth. So you are what you eat, but you are what they ate too. So if you, uh, let's use a, a cow for example, cow in a conventional feeding pen they feed it grains they feed it subsidized cheap gmo sprayed grains massively disrupt the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios make them inflamed make them get fatter quicker and it's just like our human a grain fed diet they get fatter quicker they get metabolic disease fatter quicker by the way what do you think makes more money for a farmer uh, a 500 pounder or a 400 pounder, the one that weighs more. So it's better for the farmer, worse for you, but fatter quicker, just like our, our humans do. You get metabolic disease, so they need hormones, they need antibiotics, so they can keep them alive. 70% of our antibiotics are, are used in our, in our livestock, in our feed, um, and in our livestock supply. So starting with, if there's one thing, even, even the, the dirty dozen, if there's one thing I was going to start with, organic and naturally raised, pasture raised, grass fed, free range, it would be the animal products because of that food pyramid. So big, big thing there. So those five rules, once again, once you've started eating food by God, once you've realized that, you know, kind of the priorities are decreasing your sugar, increasing your good fats, and reducing any toxins or any additives or anything processed, once you've gotten to that point, then five steps, no grains, cut those out of your diet, no dairy, cut that out of your diet as well. Limit your fruits, eat a variety of bright colors and strong flavors, and get high quality animal products. So the next webinar, you know, this is step number one, is eat a real food diet. And like I said, you cannot, you cannot go on to step number two or three or four without step number one. One and two you can kind of do together at the beginning, but they are the foundation for real health. And you can see that step number two, exercise regularly and the right amount. So incredibly important. And diet and exercise, you know, are probably the two that everybody knows that they should do, but yet they're still not doing. But I couldn't do, you know, a series on 10 steps for anything without starting with diet and exercise because they are the foundation for real health. And our real health pyramid, they are at the foundation, they are at the bottom, along with brain and nervous system health and gut health, foundational for somebody to experience real health. So make sure you stay tuned for that next webinar, stay tuned for the, what, nine or 10 to follow after that, um, and, and continue watching these. If you watch all 10, what I can promise you is that, you know, if your energy is low, step one might be the solution. You change your diet and your energy will change. You look up, type in Whole30 testimonials to, to Google, energy, sleep, clarity are always going to be some of the first things that change. But if you have a diagnosed condition or you have a struggle, you want to reverse diabetes, you want to lose 50 pounds and you've tried in the past and you've tried different diet plans that's the time that you need a coach. These 10 things are going to give you some action steps, but so many of us, we've tried different diet plans. We've tried different supplements. I just had a patient give her testimonial at, at a live event we were doing recently. And she said, well, I had tried the paleo diet. I tried these supplements. I had tried even a lot of the things that, that Dr. Taylor taught me. What he helped me do was put the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's what so many people need. Now, go out and change your diet and start exercising regularly. 
you're going to feel dramatically different. So uh, take those first two steps. You know, if you lose 20 pounds, your energy can absolutely transform. But when you want to take it a step further, that's the time for some coaching. So I put my email address up there. Uh, go to www.realhealthresource.com. That's where you can find the rest of our webinars, podcasts, ebooks, all of our resources on that site. That's why it's called Real Health Resource. But if you're interested in doing any personal coaching with me, you want to know how to put the pieces of your healthcare puzzle together and you want some help with that, you can find that on the website or you can send me an email with any questions at Dr. Taylor at realhealthresource.com. So stay tuned for the next webinar. Looking forward to talking to you about how to exercise regularly, which is you know an easy one. Not easy, but fairly simple. But the right amount is a really important thing too and how that can dramatically change your energy. So stay tuned. We'll talk to you next time on exercise regularly. And if you haven't yet, go back and watch webinar number one where we just skim through each of the 10 steps so you can know what's to come after steps one, two, and all the way through 10. And then, like I said, there is a bonus webinar at the end. So make sure you tune in to all 11 or 12 of those webinars total.